Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's SANS webcast, Eight Common OT Industrial Firewall Mistakes, sponsored by Waterfall. My name is Carol Auth of SANS, and I will be moderating today's webcast. Today's featured speaker is Mike Furstenberg, Director of Industrial Security for Waterfall Security. If during the webcast you have any questions for our presenter, please enter them into the questions window located on the GoToWebinar interface at any time. Please note that this webcast is being recorded and a copy of the slides and recording of this webcast will be available for viewing later today and can be found on the SANS registration page. And with that, I'd like to turn the webcast over to Mike. Well, thank you, Carol. I appreciate the uh, opportunity to be with everybody today, virtually, I suppose. I hope everybody is uh, staying safe, staying healthy, and staying occupied in uh, this COVID-19 world. Uh, real quickly, I just want to introduce myself because I'm sure most people do not know who I am. And while I may prefer it that way for the purposes of today, it will lend some credence to what I have to say. So I've been involved in industrial security for over 20 years now. Uh, mainly, I've been focused on industrial cybersecurity, uh, but a little bit of physical security thrown in there as well. Uh, my educational background is in chemical engineering and computer science. Uh, so I'm either the IT guy who thinks like an engineer or I'm the engineer who understands the IT vocabulary. I don't know. You'll tell me at the end of this, hopefully. Uh, by the way, uh, you can see I've got a couple of uh, SANS certs, uh, if initials after uh, my name there. I've been involved with SANS since 2005 when I attended my first SANS training back in the t-shirt days before anything with a collar. Uh, some of you know what I'm talking about. I, I, I have attended the first seven SCADA summits. Uh, Sanskata security summits and 12 of the 15 in total. Uh, and as was alluded to in general today, I'm talking about firewalls that are deployed to protect industrial control systems. Uh, but these challenges that we're talking about today could apply to other deployments as well. So real quickly, uh, I do want to introduce uh, Waterfall Security Solutions, uh, who is, and that's who I work for now. Most of the last 20 years, I did work for an infrastructure owner operator. Uh, now I'm with a vendor, namely Waterfall Security Solutions, uh, who's been around for almost 15 years now, deployed all over the world. Uh, it is an Israeli technology company we we sell technology we're we're not consultants we're not integrators uh we are focused on the security of industrial facilities uh for the record uh i generally speaking do not use the acronym ot you'll hear me say industrial you'll hear me say ics you'll hear me say automation I may at times use the phrase OT simply because over the past 10 years, it's been common parlance. It's becoming common parlance, but uh, it's not what I was brought up on. So I have a tendency to uh, fall back to the familiar. So the first thing we need to do is really establish what it is we're trying to do. Um, you know, why are we even talking about cybersecurity for industrial facilities? Um, depending on where you have been trained, where you go for your news, where you, who you associate with, you've probably at some point been trained on the typical information security uh, concept of CIA, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Uh, or if you're older, maybe it was DAD, the disclosure, alteration, or destruction of that data. Um, and the, the key to remember here is that when we're talking about industrial facilities, 
Um, we're, we're no longer talking about the data. We're talking about protecting the process. We're talking about what is important at this facility. And what's important at these type of facilities everywhere in the world, you know, you start with safety. It's always about safety. And cybersecurity is here in the industrial environment to help with safety. That's the primary goal. Of course, there are those who would claim that reliability is actually tantamount to safety, uh, simply because if the process is not operating uh, continuously, correctly, efficiently, et cetera, um, well, if we're not operating, we're not producing product, and if we're not producing product, then we are not making money. If we're not making money, we have no business, and it doesn't matter anymore if we were safe or not. Uh, so either way, these are our goals uh, from industrial cybersecurity perspective. It's no longer CIA or AIC or anything of that nature. It is now safety, reliability, and, oh, yeah, equipment protection, because a lot of the stuff you see in that picture cost a whole lot of money and you can't go down to the local best buy and buy and purchase a replacement uh we're talking 10 to 18 month lead times for some of these components so equipment damage is significant right? and that's another thing that we're here to protect so I do want to make sure that everybody's on board with the concept that this is not theoretical you know at some point when we first started in this field of industrial cybersecurity it was uh, conceptual this is not conceptual this is real this is financial risk you see that cost column all the way on the right hand side that's what we're talking about um, just a uh, quick aside for those of you playing the at-home version of the ICS security drinking game I'm not going to be saying the S word. It is way too early in the morning to start drinking. Uh, so uh, back to this little uh, graphic here. Uh, it's important to note that all of these attacks went through firewalls. Every one of these companies had firewalls in place to protect its infrastructure. So what happened? You know, how did all of these attacks get through the firewalls that were there, presumably, to protect these organizations, the value production? Um, well, that's exactly what we're here to study. I'm not going to go into the specifics uh, for a number of reasons, uh, mainly because I don't work for any of these companies, nor do I have the authority to speak on their behalf. Uh, but there's but we're going to talk about this from a more holistic uh, perspective, and you'll be able to see how these mistakes that are common in, in the world of firewalls could have contributed to all of these losses that you see on the right-hand side here. Uh, I think we all know that those numbers are on the low side um, for obvious reasons. So a uh, real quick spoiler alert, here's the message. This is what I'm talking about. Firewalls make it easy to make mistakes. And while I'm gonna talk about the most common challenges, the fact remains, if it's that easy to make mistakes, maybe we've made the wrong choice for our technology. So real quickly, because I want you to keep this in mind as an alternative choice and a better choice, quite frankly, when it comes to industrial worlds, uh, let's talk about the unidirectional security gateway. It is hardware and software. The hardware provides the security. It is one-way hardware, hence unidirectional gateway. Uh, the transmit and receive hardware modules in the center of the graphic, uh, they're connected with a fiber optic cable and the transmit module has a laser and 
no optical receiver. It can only send data. And of course, the opposite is true on the receive side. It has a photocell. It does not have a light source, so it can only receive data. It is hardware-enforced, one-way flow. And then our proprietary software uh, is installed on host computers, uh, transmit and receive. Uh, and effectively, this enables uh, any company to replicate a server from a protected facility, from an industrial network to their corporate network over one-way hardware so nothing can get back in. Everybody gets all the data they need on the corporate network where data is supposed to be, but nobody, no person, no hacker, no ransomware, no virus, no worm, et cetera, down the line, can reach back through into the process network in order to cause any kind of damage to affect the things that we're trying to protect, the safety of our personnel and our community, the equipment protection and the reliability of the process itself. So keep this in mind, it is uh, effectively what we're talking about today. Uh, just some quick, uh, a quick list of things I'm not gonna be talking about today, um, except I will right now. Um, just because um, these are some of the things that are going to come back to you on when you start being a proponent of industrial cybersecurity, when you start talking about safety and reliability instead of confidentiality, integrity, and availability, um, you're going to hear arguments like this. In fact, I heard uh, on a webinar less than two weeks ago uh, I, I heard a PhD, I'm not going to name the person, talking about outrunning the bear. Um, and we all know the argument, you know, I don't have to outrun the bear, I only have to outrun you. And while that may make sense with in certain situations, it makes a couple of assumptions. Number one, it assumes that there's only one bear. I think we all know at this point there's more than one bear out there in the forest. It also assumes that the bear doesn't have a particular taste for you, um, which, let's face it, um, while targeted attacks in industrial control system are not the norm, by the latest studies, we're talking about 23% of the, of the attacks uh, were targeted, they're, they're still 23% they're still of the time the bear wants to eat you. So it doesn't matter if I can outrun you, I still can't outrun the bear. Flawed logic. You need to be able to look at these and when you hear somebody talking about these, you need to really be ready to offer counter arguments. And, you know, of course the bottom left hand corner we already have a firewall that's enough that's what we're here to talk about today because you know that's where everybody's security program started you know firewalls and antivirus that's the that's the basics that's what that's step one that's what we have to well when it comes down to it we need to make sure we're thinking about this from the proper perspective I want you to keep these three laws in mind as we talk about this today. Uh, and you know, if you want more information on these, I, I, uh, I, I'd encourage you to Google first three laws of SCADA security. Andrew Ginter is who these are stolen from. Uh, so, you know, very simply, nothing is secure. More on that later. Uh, all software can be hacked, and that's pretty simple. That uh, I think we all can accept that as a fundamental truth. Software is written by human beings. Human beings make mistakes. Some of those mistakes are going to be security bugs. And oh yeah, that's what enables us to be hacked. And of course, we need to accept that all cyber attacks are information. They're data. We're not we're, we're not protecting the data. We need to protect ourselves from the data. 
That's the, one of the major differences we need to keep in mind here because every last bit of that data could in fact be an attack. Um, and that is what we need to prevent in the name of security. So let's get into it. So first and foremost, yes, that's a real picture. I was there when it was taken in 2006. Uh, thanks to JP, uh, he had a camera phone. I did not in 2006. Uh, so thank you for capturing that. Uh, but yeah, I, I'm, I saw this picture on somebody else's presentation at a in-person uh, event earlier this year, uh, pre-COVID, obviously. Uh, and, you know, the person sitting in front of me, who I had never met, still don't know who they were, turned to their sideline partner and said, oh, that's not real. They just make up stuff like that for dramatic effect. That picture is very real. Um, so I know everybody's seen it at some point. It's real. It, and it has relevance. Why is it relevant? It's just a reminder that every security mechanism has a fault. There's always a way around. We need to make sure we're thinking about security from a holistic perspective in terms of what actually makes sense for our goals. But back to the talk, and I do apologize, I have this habit of going off on tangents. I'll try to keep it to a minimum and catch myself. Uh, so firewalls come with an IP any, any uh, statement in them. So firewalls are software. That's the first thing we have to understand. There's an operating system, there's firmware, and then the actual functionality is the rule set. You know, if we, we define the interfaces, we get assign them IP addresses, network addresses, uh, routing tables. Effectively, a firewall is a router with, with an access list, but that's a tough, that, we'll get to more on that later. Um, so what kind of rule set is built into the firewall? This is different depending on whose firewall you purchase, what brand of firewall you purchase. And I'm not going to attack any specific brands. Uh, if you were hoping that I was going to go after such and such brand of firewall, I'm sorry, I don't do that. Um, that said, um, they're not consistent. There is no standard that says every firewall out of the box uh, should come with a permit any, any from this from industrial to corporate and a deny any any from outside in. Um, that's not how it works. <laughs> you know, some firewall vendors send their systems with a default deny any and rule because it's a firewall, it's supposed to block stuff. Others send it with a permit IP any any uh, because. Uh, well, facing facts, if somebody just plugs the firewall in and everything stops, what's that person going to do? They're going to call tech support, and tech support costs money. So let's put a permit any any rule in so that we don't get those calls when people first plug in their firewalls. Uh, it also allows them to pair it back slowly and easily. Um, so one of the things we need to realize is we've got to make those changes. We can't accept, permit any, any, or deny any, any. And, oh yeah, we might be able to see them in the rule set. We might not. Uh, depending on the vendor, it could be an explicit rule or an implicit rule. There are vendors that if there are no rules, no access list elements applied to an interface, then there is a default permit any any implied there are others there is a default deny any any if there is no access list some firewalls put a an implied deny any any after 
all the other rules that are put in manually. You have to know what you've got. So this is getting complex, <laughs> you know, especially since there may be precious little documentation about all of this. Um, you know, and I want you to think think about this once again from the perspective of our goals. We're protecting safety, reliability, uh, and equipment. And, you know, we don't – it's going to take some time and investigation, and we may or may not ever be able to see what we're talking about. And think about that in opposition to the interdirectional gateways we talked about where we've got one-way hardware server replication. So next is the rule set order. Now, rule set order, it, it, it matters. Now, you know, quick story here. Um, at a facility, um, not naming names as always, uh, and, you know, they've got a rule. Permit inside to outside. Um, permit inside our protected subnet. And destination, all RFC 1918 private IP addresses, 10 dot slash 8, 172.16, et cetera. You, you guys know this stuff. I'm not going into that level of detail. So, and of course, they're permitting all ports, TCP and UDP. So, of course, everything worked. Uh, everything worked until Audit tried to test something that should have been blocked. Uh, 66 person hours, literally, that is an exact number because that that's what happened, uh, were lost to figuring out why. The things that were supposed to be blocked weren't blocked. Um, you know, meanwhile, while they're testing for, and until internal audit went, asked for that, uh, re Regression testing. Um, well, there was no egress filter whatsoever. Um, that's a challenge. We need to have egress filters uh, in place. It's a basic principle of all firewalls. Um, you know, on the other hand, you know, once again, choosing the right technology for the right job, the, gate, the unidirectional security gateway is not going to interpret the rule set. It's going to rely on the hardware for security, and it eliminates the, the effect of uh, errors here in configuration. So, yeah, that's a real picture, too. Um, you know, the, uh, it, 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 it's meant to imply that, hey, you know, we've always done it that way, so why would we change? Well, we 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 change because we need to change. Um, you know, when you look at a firewall out of the box, it's got all kinds of admin interfaces. Uh, it's got the serial port, uh, RS-232 it might be. Uh, it's got a local port, USB. It's got Ethernet. It's, and on that Ethernet port, it may have all kinds of different communications enabled so that the administrator uh, can get to the configuration of the device via the preferred method. Um, different people like different things. You know, and that's why we have different flavors. Um, so why all of these interfaces? Well, make it easy for the customer once again. If it's not easy for the customer, they call tech support. Tech support costs money. We don't like that. <laughs> so, you know, it's. It, it, it it's related to the next uh, top the next issue that we're going to talk about, but you know, putting it simply, people don't always disable uh, the interface the administrative interfaces they're not using. Um, first of all, you generally speaking can't disable the serial interface, and you shouldn't be able to. Uh, but if you're never going to use a web interface, if you're never going to use HTTPS, and you're always going to use a command line over SSH, 
Why would you leave the web interface enabled for administration? Your your exposure level is going is is going through the roof with everything that you leave enabled. Um, this is, you know, we've we've always done it. We we need to make it easy for administrators. We need to have that backup administration pathway just in case. And what we're actually doing in this case is increasing the exposure. Um, you know, once again, is this the right technology? You know, protecting a process, protecting safety, um, as opposed to the gateway, which can't be remotely misconfigured to permit inbound attacks. It's one-way hardware, plain and simple. So I said the next one was kind of related. Well, yeah, it's related. Uh, you've got to change those default passwords. You know, everybody's been saying it for years, decades, really. Uh, everything comes with a default password out of the box. Um, it's really, really, really easy to go look up, uh, you know, what is the default password for X, Y, Z. You know, I, I remember, um, you know, we'd hire external penetration testers to come in uh, once a year, pretty much. And over the years, I got to know this one pen tester from a particular company. And, you know, the, the, the testing would occur off hour is from a corporate perspective, keep in mind from a plant perspective, there may not be off hours, but we, they're, they're doing their testing uh, effectively from midnight to 6 a.m. Those are their hours for penetration testing to be the least impactful. Um, and I remember talking to her and, you know, talking to the pen tester about about it and she tells me this works every time uh local admin passwords almost never get changed uh you know from what she she tells me and i went and verified uh depending on the firewall manufacturer all those different admin interfaces we talked about well they may each have a different admin password hard-coded not hard-coded but initial assignment. So hopefully you don't have devices that are old enough to have hard-coded passwords in them anymore, but if you do get rid of them, get uh, get rid of those old firewalls. Um, if they're infrastructure devices, obviously you can't, but firewalls with hard-coded passwords, get rid of them. Uh, if they're default passwords, change them and make sure that you're looking to see if they are interface specific. Uh, furthermore, um, just because we've configured uh, our authentication for some external source, whatever it may be, uh, there's still the, the default password is still there. And it's still there because stuff happens. Sometimes AD goes down. Sometimes the multi-factor authentication server goes down. Sometimes the network goes down. And if that happens, you still need to be able to authenticate to the firewall. Even And at that point, it's going to default to its locally stored password for the admin interface. Uh, it's the break glass procedure. Um, we've got to be aware of that because that could potentially be also a means used by attackers. You know, they, this is this is continued errors and omissions, um, and that's not a bad. That, that's not to say that the firewall administrator uh, is evil. Um, not the case at all. It's a significant challenge to get around the errors and omissions for things like this. That's why we're talking about it here today. Uh, so patching. Now, I 
deployed hundreds of firewalls every year for over a decade. And insert brand name of firewall, never once called me to say, hey, Mike, you know those firewalls you bought? Well, there's a vulnerability in version X dot Y. And you should patch to X dot Y dot two so that you're not vulnerable anymore. Um, it, it doesn't happen. They've, they've got millions of customers around the world. They're not calling you to say, or, or me, or any of us to say, hey, you got a vulnerability. It doesn't work that way. They publish that there's a vulnerability on their website at, when they've got a patch released for it. Now, just because there's a patch doesn't mean I can deploy said patch to my environment, uh, particularly in the automation world where every patch is a threat to stability and safe and safety. Now I've got to test that to make sure that I'm not going to affect the safety. I'm not going to affect the reliability inadvertently by patching. Um, some companies test as long as a year. Uh, I, I've never seen anybody test for less than six weeks. Uh, so for at least six weeks, I'm exposed. Because Why am I exposed? Because it, it, it's too easy to figure out what firewall I'm running. First of all, you know, you, know, you can probably figure it out from open source intelligence. Um, if you can't, once again, I refer you back to the pen tester type thing. Um, you know, it's, you run an NMAP scan with OS identification. Um, if you want to go real old school, you use P0F, uh, passive OS fingerprint. You know, it's, you know it, it's too easy to figure out what firewall brand, what operating system, what version we're running. And, oh, yeah, then I take three minutes as an attacker. I Google that version and that that vendor and I find the vulnerabilities knowing full well that you know <laughs> you might have patched last year's vulnerabilities and bingo I've got you now once again you know we're, we're looking at the wrong technology for protection the unidirectional security gateway yes it's got patches it's got patches for functionality and it may have patches related to security, but it is. But since we've got one-way hardware, uh, regardless of whether there is an operating system patch or an, a software-level patch, application patch necessary, the security is maintained because we chose the right technology. Uh, you know, th th this is a this is a fun one. Yeah, you know? uh, so it's important to remember, um, you know, that we we can't just put in the firewall and go. Uh, I'm secure. I'm I'm going home. I'm going to sleep. Well, first off, uh, you can't be secure. That's not a real thing. I know as a vendor, I should be sitting here telling all of you, buy my stuff, it'll make you secure. Um, well, you can't be secure. I'm sorry to be the one to break it to you. You can be more secure. You can be less secure than you are today, but you cannot be secure. It, it, it's a marketing term. It, it, it's a sales term. It, you know, it, anybody who tells you that that they can make you secure, or they're selling you a secure system. Well, you know, they're, they're actually selling you stuff. They're selling you a line at that point. Um, sorry, went off the deep end again. Um, so the, the point here is that the firewall doesn't travel alone. 
there's always going to be compensating controls that go along with the firewall. You know, that you're going to need intrusion detection systems uh, to watch on both sides of the firewall. You're going to need wa logging systems, log management infrastructure. Uh, you're going to need more actual infrastructure. You're going to need more switches and routers because you've broken up your network. Uh, oh, yeah, and you're going to need more authentication systems because we know from the guidance from everybody and their mother, including the, the uh, government, that spanning authentication domains is wrong. <laughs> this is how attacks get in. We've seen it in the real world. You know, it's, it, it's you know, how, how can you separate networks whether with whatever technology you're using, um, and then you and then span the the two networks that you just separated with an application like Active Directory or whatever authentication database you're using. Authentication domains cannot be shared. Ah, sorry, I went off went on the tangent again. There, uh, the point here <laughs> is that when we look at the cost of firewalls, we've got to consider all the costs associated with them. It's not just this X priced piece of equipment and software that I'm putting in place. It's what is the OPEX tail? What additional infrastructure do I need? Etc. And what's that you say about the OPEX tail? Oh, yeah, this is my favorite. Um, you know, it happens. A whole lot of firewalls, you know, they're not static. N nobody's ever put in a firewall uh, and five years later ripped it out and it had the same rule set on, on day 1500, day 1800 that it did on day two. It doesn't happen. Why doesn't it happen? Because the needs of the organization change, uh, the folks who are protected or on the unprotected side will call up the firewall admin going, hey, I need this now, I need this now. And it could be three o'clock in the morning, it's an emergency change request, it gets implemented. And does it ever get pulled back out? Does it ever get deprecated? That depends, if you remember. Um, oh yeah, good, 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 uh, Good admins, you know, backup admins. That that that's extremely relevant. I mean, here's a here's another one. I, I can tell you a story about an organization where uh, they had a firewall administrator who was pretty darn good, and that firewall administrator had a backup, an apprentice, who they trained over years, and that firewall administrator left the organization and took their apprentice with them because they could. And now the organization in question is left scrambling. What are we gonna do? What are we gonna do? Uh, so what they did do was start paying $2.2 million a year in outsourced management fees to maintain the 250 firewalls that they had in place that were being maintained by those two people who weren't making anywhere close to $2.2 .2 million. Anybody here who's a firewall administrator or network admin, network engineer knows that. Uh, so, you know, once again, you know, it, it comes down to the technology choice. You know, when, when you put in place something like a gateway, uh, it, it eliminates the, the challenges associated with needing that firewall admin and returns that firewall admin, network admin, uh, to doing work that uh, is more enabling for, for the organization they work for. So here's a favorite of mine. You know, back in the day, uh, more than a decade ago, I'm not going to give the exact time frame, but I took it. SANS 504 Hacker Techniques uh, Incident Handling. Ed Scotus was the teacher. He was our instructor. He's phenomenal. 
Uh, I can't say enough good things about them. And my enduring memory from that class is that quote, outbound access equals inbound command and control. That's a necessity that every firewall administrator has to understand. It's, it's TCP IP, think about it. TCP IP is necessarily bi-directional. Sin, sin, act, act. Response, you know, think about it. You know, if, it, if you're opening up the firewall to permit port 80 and 443 so the web can be served, but we didn't, we, we didn't open anything back up to come back in, well, we're still getting responses. You know, there's no explicit rule that's permitting them. That's because today's firewalls are stateful packet filtering or UTM devices that maintain the state table and will permit that response to come back in. And that response could be the, the, the response from the website that I went to, or it could be an attack. No, it's outside of my control. Um, you know that, and that that's how all kinds of attacks work. That's how the watering hole attacks work. That's how a lot of the early attacks, you know, think back 15 years work when you went to MLB.com and their rotating ads were infected. Um, you know that actually happened. Or, a long time ago in a different world. But, you know, it, it, it's a fact. Outbound access equals inbound command and control. That's how the attacks work. That's how the ransomware works. That's how the hackers work. That's how just about everything that the firewall is there to prevent works and gets through the firewall. Once again, Comes back down to the technology choice. Are we making the correct choice of technology for what it is that we're protecting? Uh, did we want that that potential for inbound command and control, or did we want one-way server replication? So, real quickly, you know, automation, you know, it, it's technology for efficiency. It's for the elimination of errors and omissions, E&O. You know, you think back to a few decades, that's the whole point of industrial automation, efficiency and elimination of E&O. And security, particularly cybersecurity, aimed to protect the automation must follow. We absolutely, you know, have to go the same way. And this is the result when we grow, when we modernize. You know, we achieve the needs of today's automated systems. Uh, today's industrial automation has a need for integration. There is a need for enterprise end-to-end -end communications, and this is how it can be done to achieve the goals properly. It comes down to technology selection. If we want security and visibility, along with discipline, discipline control that we need to make things work in the environments that we all live in. Well, it comes down to a technology choice. You know, th this whole concept, the whole concept of this talk is not to say, here's error number one, here's error number two, Here's error number 43, and don't make any of these errors. No. The point is to make sure that we're picking the technology that will help us reduce the potential for errors to occur or eliminate the, the ability for errors to occur. You know, that this is what we're talking about when we're talking about the needs, the, the cybersecurity needs of today's industrial control systems, automation. If you want to say OT, go for it. So real quick, uh, 
you know, this slide is marketing. I'm not going to lie to anybody. Uh, it, it's marketing, uh, plain and simple. But it's important from a security perspective. Why is it important? I'm a security professional. I'm in no way, shape, or form a marketing guy. Um, so, you know, it's important. I can look at this and say, you know what? That's actually some guidance I can use. That's some guidance. What do I need to do as a security professional? What are my goals for my company? And hey, marketing slide, actually relevant to the real world. I'm going to have to praise somebody over that. That's, that's pretty awesome. Um, sorry if I just insulted anybody. Um, or anybody's profession, I really didn't intend it that way. Um, so moving on, you know, that's effectively what I wanted to say. Uh, I do want to make it known that, you know, Waterfall, uh, yes, we're a technology vendor, but we also, you know, are citizens of the planet and we live here. <laughs> and so we uh, kind of have a responsibility to make sure things get done right, um, especially in the worlds that we live in. You know, so one of the things that Waterfall does is we have an industrial security podcast. Andrew Ginter hosts it. Um, it's not about Waterfall. It's different guests every other week. Um, it's actually over 30,000 downloads per episode at this point. You know, it's a, if you're new to this and you know, stuff that happened 20 years ago is new to you. This is a great way to come up to speed. If you're not new to this and you want to hear the latest and greatest uh, from the, those who have been deemed experts around the world, well, this is a great way to hear what they have to say as well. And, you know, it's a different topic every week, and it, it really isn't uh, – it's not waterfall-related. So with that said, I – did want to make sure I'm going to leave this slide up because it's got my email address on it. And if anybody wants to send me a question privately because they didn't want to ask it publicly, um, you know, I, I, I'm happy to answer questions with the caveat that, you know, first and foremost, I'm an engineer. So the two most common answers you're going to get from me, number one most common answer is I don't know. And the second most common answer is, well, it depends. So, you know, you may not get the answer you're looking for, but I'm going to try. I'm happy to share whatever it is I've learned over the over the decades at this point. Geez, I'm getting old. Um, but with that in mind, you know, I, I, I do think uh, we need to uh, offer everybody the opportunity to ask questions and to uh, – find out, you know, what do you want to hear about today that I missed? So, Carol, I'm going to turn it back to you for a little Q&A session, if that's all right. Absolutely, yes. Thanks for that great presentation. We do have a bunch of questions that have been submitted for the Q&A. However, if anyone has a question for Mike, please enter it into the questions window now. Our first one asks, in the unidirectional model, how are patches up patches, comma, updates deployed on the industrial control system? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about patching the, uh, patching the firewall itself. And, you know, as part of that, we talked about the testing. Uh, the testing itself uh, is a long, long process. You know, you've got to make sure you're not going to impact the safety and reliability. It's even more stringent when it comes to change control in the automation world. You can't just change the operating system because it's Tuesday. It doesn't work that way in a plant. You've got to make sure that we're still going to be able to operate safely and we're not going to impact production by deploying this patch. And, oh, yeah, if it requires a restart, uh, it's going to have to wait till the next production outage. Um, so, you know, different different customers of ours 
uh, do, do things differently. Uh, some have said, you know, it's a long process. It, it's a year long process and saving five minutes uh, it, by doing it over the network. I don't want to do that. I want to visit the individual workstations to patch them. Others take a different approach and will use automation. Once again, they're going to make sure they're separating their authentication domains, which necessarily will also separate their patch domains as well as their antivirus domains. Uh, and they're going to, it's going to look different. It, it, plain and simple, it, it, it's not deploying antivirus to the corporate workstation. Um, you can't just roll out the patch to the HMI or the engineering workstation because it's Tuesday. Like I said, we're, we're in, in the physical world. We're not in the virtual world. We can't re, we can't re, we can't reboot and restore from backup when we're talking about a turbine. Um, it, it's not physically possible. So it, it, it is going to be a different process. Um, and th there are technology, technology enablers to make it happen if uh, the automation is desired or required. Uh, most most look at the process and say, yeah, that's not actually the right way to go about this when we start thinking about what it is we're actually protecting. All right, thank you. Uh, is the entire server replicated by the UGW, or can I pick and choose the data sources from multiple servers in the ICS network and have them replicated over to one server on the corporate network? Uh, another good question. Um, so the answer there is yes. Um, and I realized that was an either or question. Uh, so. I'll go back to my most common answers, which is it depends. Yes, it is possible. And yes, everybody does it. Um, that's how the the unidirectional security gateway works. It, it, it's not replicating an entire server uh, from one network to the other over the one-way hardware unless that's what it's told to do through the software. More often, uh, the owner operator of the facilities will say, I want this particular, I want this historian to be replicated and I want, uh, tags that match, uh, the following pattern to get replicated. And these tags should never be replicated because they belong to the plant and not to corporate. Um, uh, others will say, hey, I want these OPC servers. I want OPC A, OPC B, not C, but E and F. I want those replicated. Uh, and you can get as granular with the control as you want. Uh, it is specific. It is very specific to what is being replicated and only what is configured to be replicated will be replicated. All right, thanks. Uh, what about use cases that need data to be moved from the corporate network to the ICS network? The ITOT convergence is increasing with deployments of ADMS, Advanced Distribution Management Systems. That's, an, that's a good question. And uh, there, there's technology solutions for all of that. Uh, you know, but it's important to first make sure that the appropriate solutions are being put in place. In many cases, that which we think of to be bi-directional doesn't need to be. In, in many cases, you know, I can't tell you how many times I've been brought in and, and sat down around the conference room table with the whiteboard uh, talking through, well, we need it to be bi-directional because we need it to do X, Y, and Z. And once we start mapping things out and drawing things out on the whiteboard, 
uh, lo and behold, uh, n none of it actually required bidirectional connectivity for, between multiple networks. Uh, so that's the best way to handle uh, questions like that is to think about what is actually required uh, and then choose the appropriate technology for that type of solution. It could be it could it could be that bidirectional is required. If that's the case, what type of bidirectional is required? Is it because we're changing orders once a day? Well, we may be able to put in place a timed connection that's one way inbound for 30 seconds every 2 a.m. to replicate that day's orders in place. Uh, we have technology that, that, that does that. It's been commercial technology from from us for oh at least six years now. Um, you know, there's there's other technology solutions out there, and the important part is we match the technology to the needs, but we need to make sure we're actually looking at the at the needs and understanding them fully. All right, thank you. Uh, what are your thoughts on the supposed? Uh, well, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure you can get into this, but let's see. What are your What are your thoughts on the supposed cyber war between Iran and Israel's infrastructure? <laughs> uh, I could give you my thoughts. There wouldn't be a problem with me sharing my thoughts, but they'd be exactly that. My thoughts um, and the thoughts uh, of of a kid from New Jersey who got a degree in chemical engineering and a degree in computer science aren't really that relevant when it comes to international disputes. I don't have a background in politics. I don't have a background in warfare. I've never been part of any military organization. So I really, uh, you know, I can, like I said, I can give you my thoughts. They're useless and they're relevant. <laughs> Hope that helps. <laughs> All right, thank, thank you. Um, how this isn't quite phrased as a complete sentence, but how quick manufacturing site isolation can be planned with firewall in an in an event like WannaCry? I'm sorry, I could you repeat that? I think I broke up there for a second. You know what? I'll put it in the chat window because it's not quite in a okay. complete sentence there. And by the way, uh, in response to your other question, they said, ha, 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 thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, it, it, it's the real answer. I can't you know, say anything that would, that would be relevant in that, to that particular question. So, you know, when it comes to to an event like WannaCry, and I'll just start in on what I think the question was, um, you know, it, it's it's ransomware. Uh, ransomware requires a couple of things to exist. Um, one of the one of those things is, in fact, bidirectional communication. If it, you know, if we had a firewall in place, uh, understanding that out, outbound access is inbound command and control, well, the path is now enabled. The circuit can be completed and the ransomware can be activated. And oh yeah, that's exactly what's happened. Uh, so armed with that information, it, it, it's once again, break the chain. How do we break the chain? Uh, One-way communication, that works just, just quite nicely. And by the way, I'm not saying that Every firewall needs to be replaced with an directional security gateway. Strategic, strategically, we need to assess which firewalls should be replaced with the directional security gateway. Where does it make sense? Um, so, we're, you know, at, at that point, we're e we're either blocking the ransomware from getting in in the first place because we've got the unidirectional gateway protecting our important networks, or we're blocking the communication outbound to the internet because of the one-way hardware, not 
even you, there's no physical path out. Um, and you may say, well, my protected network is not connected to the internet, but if it's connected to your corporate network through a firewall, which your corporate network is connected to the internet through the firewall because, oh yeah, it's 2020 and everybody's is, um, you know, guess what? It's just a hop. It's a pivot point. It doesn't make things inherently more difficult or even challenging for any modern ransomware. You know, the modern ransomware that we're looking at, you know, this was nation state stuff five years ago. Now it's commodity stuff. So, you know, we've got to be aware of the progression here and we've got to be certain that we're implementing technology not just for today but for tomorrow as well because i think we all know how long things tend to last in a in a plant environment all right well that's all the time we have for today thank you so much mike for your great presentation and to waterfall for sponsoring this webcast which helps bring this content to the sands community to our audience we greatly appreciate you listening in for a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.